Y'all ever wonder about that live action Dead Space movie? Well, here it is. Dead Space is a science fiction horror film made in 1991. It was written by Catherine Siren, directed by Fred Gallo, produced by Mike Elliott, and with the legendary Roger Corman serving as executive producer, you already know what time it is. So settle in and join me as we take a deeper look at some 1970s cheese from the early 1990s. Our intrepid saga begins with this ultra high budget special effects intro. Then we find a rather competent fellow alerting Mr. White that something isn't quite right. Mr. Employee of the Month suddenly remembers he's bleeding and then suddenly the others find him dead. But you didn't account for this. Cue super high budget awesome title screen. Cut to our main hero Han Solo, I mean Commander Krieger backstage at a Lady Gaga concert before he is rudely interrupted by his robot sidekick, Tin Pan, who reports that he's picking up a distress signal. But before the commander can get his clothes on, space battle. After a brief cameo by Cornholio, fire, 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 fire. Captain Krieger manages to survive and track the distress signal to planet Fabon. The crew land their interstellar jalopy there and make their cinematic entrance, but it turns out that they maybe not have even been needed at all. The crew decides to leave once their ship is fixed, but oops, JK, you guys, the scientist needs you to stick around and take care of the absolute disaster that is this guy, sure. But nah, it turns out they were working on a cure for some ultra-powerful virus and the dolt from earlier contracted it. What? After a little more exposition, Commander Krieger says something that every man wants to hear from his woman. It's time I took a look at your... monster. Commander Krieger gets his wish, only to find himself in a textbook experiment gone horribly wrong in the name of science, when this lady gets her mouth... Uh, nose? Infiltrated by the escaped experiment. Cut to emergency surgery. Of course, the brain is gone. We knew that before we started. After leaving the patient in stitches with that A-plus surgical joke, she begins to have muscle spasms, then the chest burst... I mean experimental virus, takes form and bursts out of her and escapes easily. That's what you call a muscle spasm? That's what I call science. Yeah, Mr. White! Yes, yeah, science! Anyway, back in the conference room, more exposition happens, which leads the group to eventually decide to trap the creature by closing it up in the ventilation system. Let the overacting ensue while Krieger drops some backstory about the recently deceased instead of helping with the whole vent closing thing. The scientists continue to argue while one team does their job and the other team continues to dick around. Then, someone gets a well-deserved burn. Can I help? Yeah, right. Last time you helped, we lost three programs. Yeah, Tim. Three whole programs lost because you're too focused on your terrible fashion sense while we're working at a research facility that houses dangerous viruses. Cut back to the guy who wishes he was the hero of the story, right before he learns the meaning of you don't want that smoke. The creature escapes again, and the crew decides to hole up for the night, with the creature apparently sealed up somewhere. Back at his love interest's quarters, Krieger inspects the lady's room and promptly says some pimp shit, right before his robot malfunctions. Oh, hey, uh, my robot malfunctions, so it looks like I better stay in your room tonight. Somewhere, James T. Kirk and Zap Brannigan are smiling. Elsewhere, this guy finally lost his goofy-ass shirt, and it looks like he's trying to get Blake Lively's older sister to take off some articles of clothing as well. And he shoots, he scores! Soon after, it is revealed that Mr. White has space cancer. And then we veer off into near softcore porn. I'm not even kidding. If these were the old days of YouTube, I would just straight up show y'all. But uh, these days, it's enough to get you a strike. And at any rate, though, uh, Laura May Tate has absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. Oops, uh, actually, it turns out that was just the scientist's romance novel-inspired sex nightmare. 
and just as she wakes up, Krieger is there to comfort her, right before jump scare, followed by the third clean escape by the creature. Marissa and Krieger then call everyone to action because they found the creature, but obviously Tim can't do anything without his stupid ass shirt. Back in the medical lab, our would-be hero from before is now missing a face. Cut to Krieger catching the monster doing its best Alfred Hitchcock silhouette impression. Then he meets up with Marissa in a random hallway and the pair skulk around a foggy room, looking for the now gigantic creature which they then clumsily fight. During the fight, Krieger pulls yet another play out of the Zap Brannigan playbook. Eventually the monster escapes again, but this time it actually leaves the facility. Krieger decides to go out and kill it. The crew decides to help him with this very underwhelming looking environmental hazard suit, which he doesn't even bother to fully wear. Krieger tracks the monster through the Arizona desert with blue color correction, while the scientists conduct more research and the two lovers watch Krieger. Suddenly, Tim grows a brain and starts pointing out Krieger's ineptitude, but Jill doesn't take him seriously. Probably because he wears that stupid ass shirt every day, and you know what, I agree with Jill. Shortly afterward, Dr. Darden reveals that they accidentally the whole disease, and then Krieger proves how awesome he is by arbitrarily climbing up the side of the cliff face and falling off onto this conveniently placed disappearing mattress. Tin Pan and Krieger take refuge in a cave right before Tim says the smartest thing that anyone says in this movie. What's your problem? I mean, it's obvious, this guy is an idiot. Then the pair get attacked. Jill decides to help. Krieger makes it difficult. Tin Pan gets wasted. And then the creature re-enters the facility. Krieger grieves the loss of his wingman, and then Jill gets snatched up because she has the big dumb. Tim realizes that the creature is headed directly for him and pieces out. Marissa almost kills Krieger, thinking he's the creature, and then Lori Lively returns in her new role, the incredible melting woman, and begs for a quick death. Krieger obliges and runs off to find the monster. Tim and Marissa find the monster, who is now apparently stationary yet still somehow frightening. Marissa shows off her plot armor right before Tim gets murked by being thrown behind the creature while Marissa easily just walks away. And man, that is one picky killing machine. Elsewhere, Dr. Darden comes up with a brilliant plan to stop the beast, while his partner takes a quick nap on this decomposing corpse. Dr. Darden had his blood drawn and then placed into syringe darts to allow the space can I mean Delta 9 virus to kill the monster. Back in the monster's lair, we find Krieger and Marissa confirming Tim's death, before Krieger once again makes Zap Brannigan proud by pushing his female companion into harm's way in order to save his own hide. This kicks off some of the most underwhelming and inept fight scenes ever put to film, which are thankfully interrupted by the scientists barging in and darting the monster. Krieger throws a chair because, you know, why the hell not? And then the monster responds in kind by eating Dr. Stoke. Krieger then just sort of decides to feed Dr. Darden's head to the monster so he can escape once again, right? Wrong! Krieger stands there in mild amusement while the monster apparently decides to run away instead of murdering his face. Krieger happens upon the monster in a hallway, dead from the effects of space cancer. But it's not over yet because the monster produces two offspring that, again, magically escape from Krieger with very little difficulty. Elsewhere, Marissa is having a psychotic breakdown while Krieger hunts for the monsters. Marissa finds one under the covers. Krieger gets bitten by the other one. Marissa stabs the one under the covers continuously. Krieger kills the other one with fire. Fade out to high-tech space scenery. Back aboard the ship, Tin Pan is fixed, and now Marissa is chilling in the Depeche Mode sauna room. Marissa wants to make good on a sex nightmare, so the couple share a rather awkward exchange, and then the credits roll. This Concord Productions film doesn't have a lot of information available about its production, but uh, someone on IMDb said that director Fred Gallo saw the script for the first time on the first day of filming, and 
I don't know if that's true, but I definitely believe it. The internet also says pretty unequivocally that this is a much worse ripoff of another Roger Corman movie titled Forbidden World, which is apparently also a ripoff of Alien. So here we are with a ripoff of a ripoff of a ripoff that is home to reused footage from Battle Beyond the Stars. Corman has been known to do this in the past, and this is not even close to the only film that features reused footage from that particular movie. The internet generally hates this movie, and it's got some hilarious reviews with really low scores to match. Given that Roger Corman probably spent like 20 bucks to make this remake of a ripoff, this is probably the best we were ever, ever gonna get. This movie tries its best to play it straight, but the execution falls flat pretty much everywhere, and the only major bright spot, beyond the unintentional comedy that is, lies in seeing Brian Cranston before he had really honed his craft. Really though, to be fair, it's pretty obvious that this was slapped together and that most film students could achieve a similar result with the same access to Roger Corman's vault of things left over from other movies and only the money they have in their pocket. And as if that wasn't bad enough, since it's also a triple ripoff, the plot really just does the movie absolutely no favors. Between the monster's plot convenient and poorly portrayed actions to the whole Krieger can get bitten but doesn't melt thing, I'm not exactly sure what these particular people were planning to do here. Either way, I've seen this movie a total of five times, and I'm happy to say I enjoy this cheesy piece of shit, even if it looks like it was made in the 1970s. The film actually has some jumps that might catch you sleeping. Now to bring it full circle, as it relates to Dead Space, there are a lot of similarities here. The uh, biggest being the scenery and the very similar sounding and sort of similar looking creature. Beyond all of that, it's really hard to know if Glenn Schofield who created the game conceptually after watching science fiction horror movies for inspiration, was really influenced by this film or not. But it would seem that they share quite a bit of common science fiction horror DNA, regardless of whether he was influenced by them or not. At the end of the day, this is a movie that you should not watch, unless you can stomach B-movie cheese. And if you're into that kind of thing, then you're in for an absolute treat from one of the B-movie maestros. So if you're, you know, into that kind of thing, you can pick up this two-pack DVD that features Dead Space and another similar movie, The Terror Within. Either way, thanks for watching and stay tuned for more videos.